Hello and thank you for joining us for another profitable 30 minutes on Capital Market Live on Channel Television. Good evening, I'm Amy John Mekwa. Well, let's begin with a review of some of the global equities market. We'll start first with the European stock market, which closed low on Friday, reversing earlier gains as traders weighed concerns over rising inflation and central bank action. The German DAX was down 0.09%. France CAC index dipped lower by 0.31%. On the flip side, the UK's FTSE 100 rose by 0.07%. Now, on the data front, the UK economy rose just 0.1% in July as the spread of COVID-19 Delta variant slowed economic activity to a trickle after the easing of lockdown measures. Similarly, the German Consumer Price Index grew 0.1% month on month in August, marking an annual increase of 3.4%. We move to Asia now where shares rose on Friday as investors monitored Hong Kong listed stocks of firms in regulation hit sectors such as video games. The broader Hang Seng index in Hong Kong jumped 1.91% while mainland Chinese stocks closed higher with the Shanghai composite rising 0.27%. In Japan, the Nikkei 225 rose 1.25% 1 to close at 30,381.84 points. We move over to the United States now. The Dow Jones Industrial Average declined for a fifth straight day on Friday as economic uncertainty loomed. The blue chip index shed 271.66 points to close at 34,607.72. The S&P 500 dipped nearly 0.8%, while the Nasdaq Composite retreated about 0.9%. For the week, the Dow was down about 2.2%. Its second negative week in a row. The S&P 500 is off about 1.7% for the week, while the Nasdaq Composite is 1.6% lower. The S&P 500 and the Dow haven't recovered since the poor jobs report last week, Friday, falling each day since, including all four trading days of the holiday shortened week. Now back home in Nigeria, the domestic stock market in Nigeria closed bearish in the second trading week of September, down 0.86%, and that was due to sell-side pressure. However, performance on the activity chart was mostly positive, as 1.43 billion shares changed hands for 13.07 billion naira in over 19,000 deals. Meanwhile, sectoral performance closed mixed for the week, while the oil and gas index being the biggest advancer was up 2.28%. O&O topped the gain has charts by 14%. Cornerstone Insurance led the laggards for the week down 15.79%. While the trio of First Bank, Access Bank and Wemma Bank were major contributors to the total volume of shares traded in the week. Meanwhile, activities at the unlisted securities market ended the week positive as both uh, the Nasdaq OTC security index and the market capitalization increased by 0.40%. At the same time, Nasdaq Investors gained 2.59 billion naira in value, taking the market capitalization to 641.34 billion naira this week, in contrast to 638.75 billion naira recorded on the 3rd of September as a result of positive movements in prices. The total value traded during the week rose by more than 1,000% as the market recorded a total of 1.11 billion naira compared to 95.43 billion naira recorded in the previous week. Also, total number of securities traded increased by 69.94% to 10.26 million units with Nigerian Exchange Group PLC ranking top among the five most traded securities by volume. That's like PLC led the advances for the week, while Food Concepts PLC led the losers. Well, let's cross over to the fixed income market now. We're trading in the secondary bonds market. Close the week with mixed sentiment. This follows higher treasury bills stop rates amid investors' less aggressive cherry-picking activities. Buying interest was seen at the short and mid-dated instrument, while holders of the long-term bonds repriced upward. The overall average benchmark yield rose by five basis points to 11.1% week on week. At the treasury 
Treasury bills market. Trading activities turned bearish following market participants' reaction to the increase in the stop rate of the long-dated instrument at Wednesday's NTB primary act market auction. At the close of market this week, the average yield for Treasury bills rose by 30 basis points to 4.9%, while open market operation bills were up 10 basis points to close at 6.2%. Well, we'll talk more about the performance of the fixed income market uh, over the week. Uh, well, and in the month, I guess, uh, we do maybe Ude Gunam, a fixed income dealer at UBA. Normally, we will have do maybe call us for just a couple of minutes uh, during a business morning, but today we'll have an extensive conversation with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having this me. Saturday evening. So, uh, let's describe with how, let's start with how you would describe the market performance this week, uh, the stop rate increase and all that. What's your perception? Okay, so basically, it was quite a really active week. Actually, we both had, we had an Omo auction as well, and as the primary NTB auction, as you mentioned, we saw stop rates increase to 7.2 from 6.8, and we also saw an increase in sales. They offered 138 billion, but they sold 209 billion. So what this means right now is the uh, the DMO in construction with the C band is trying to make the rates attractive on the long end of the curve. If you do a cross-sectional analysis with our pairs, let's say Ghana, the NTB rates there or the long year NTB rates there is about 12.28% compared to where we had rates are before 6.8%. If you compare with other mint countries, that is Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Tunisia, those are like the countries poised for developed markets in the next 10 years, our rates are the lowest there. So to try and get back um, FPI inflows, I think this was the ideology of the DMO in conjunction with the CBN to kind of increase rates. Did we see this coming or is, did, it just, did the CBN just say, oh, things have been really quiet in the markets, let's just beef it up? Or was it intentional? Was it planned? Should well, we be expecting another increase, you know, in the nearest future? Well, first things first, there's so much uncertainty in the markets, judging from where we came from the pandemic to where there's so much uncertainty in the market. And also, if you look at our real negative real rate of return, so we have um, our one-year treasury bill at 7.2 compared to an inflation of 17.38. So that's already a real rate of, of this. That's really a negative real rate of return. So it reached a point where the market sentiment was, have we reached a support level where it's going to bounce back at 6.8 so i think that was the ideology and hence the increase in rates to 7.2 and then we had two auctions uh, over the week yeah so we had so we had like i said the omo auction where before this month by july 15 was the last time we saw an omo auction till august 5th or till the last week to the last week in august where we saw an omo auction the volumes of the omo auctions have been kept at a regulated level 30 billion 50 billion so they haven't really much yet. however rates have been maintained at 10.1 to at the long end of the curve mm. so now that we saw this increase in rates uh, what do you think could be going on in the mind of investors would they say okay um i was i was kind of skeptical about the fixed income market but now perhaps there'll be another you know does it create uncertainty or does it just attract more people well it, well, it creates a less a wait and see environment because we have an auction coming in next week too where about 155 billion might be rolled over also and we also have an Omo maturity about 38 billion so let's see where, where this week blows but we, we expect to see more subscription by a lot of by local participants as well as FPIs in the market because this 7.2 is a clear sign okay is there is there room for a higher resistance beyond 7.2 hmm. so you mentioned more local participants uh, in the equities now it I mean, the picture has kind of changed. So you have more local participants than the foreign. Is that a problem, having more local investors? Well, well, I think the, the word here she used to term that is you don't want your economy being run by hot money. That is FBIs who just come in one year, they're out. You no, know, we saw that happen in the pandemic year where we saw a large amount of capital outflows in our economy. Capital outflows, which... We recorded about 45% drop in capital inflows due to that. So we do not want our economy based on hot money, you no know, quote unquote FBI. So 
us having larger amount of local participants is a good thing. So we have to try and increase that and see how well we can maximize the NSC of the, the, the stock markets because we are actually underperforming compared to our working population and the growth of so many companies. There's still more room for a lot of people to participate in that market. But well, how do you balance that with we also need more foreign participation because we need FX because we you know how do you balance that yeah so on, on the on the on the issue of FX like I said even if you look at this year with our capital importations is about 800 billion it dropped from where we are coming from 1.9 billion in Q1 and also if you look at other indices as we all seen happen in the, in the FX market so we need that balance as at the same time we need a stronger leverage on our local participation so if the ease of doing business indexes increase and they are better suiting environment for investors. The FBIs and also the FDIs will come in. <laughs> okay. So at the next NTB PMA, the CBN is set to roll over 161.79 billion naira worth of instruments. How do you see investors, you know, behaving or reacting? You know, so like I like, so like I said, we would definitely see an increase in subscription, reason from what we saw, the seven point. So you don't think the uh, uncertainty and wait and see attitude would? Yeah, it's, it's still going to be there, but a lot of market participants would definitely would bid higher or probably throw in the exact same business where we saw. But the 6.8 levels or the lows we've seen might be drifting apart. So mm -hmm. we might see a lot of people go for these higher rates. And like I said, the wait and see will still be there. However, there will be more subscription in the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, analysts uh, expect the market to continue to trade sideways, you know, ahead of the August inflation results. And the MPC meeting is also coming up on, on Thursday yeah. and Friday. How do you expect so, this? So, well, this MPC meeting is going to be very, it's going to be a very interesting one. You know, from the last MPC meeting, we had already passed the, the, the law where, you know, they stopped selling of FX to BDCs. BDCs. And no, uh, we've seen four conservative jobs in our inflation. Fund. And then we've seen the, the, the value of Naira. I mean, it's yeah. been it's been scary. Yes. I think uh, um, as of yesterday, it was about 547. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, permit me to paint a, a bit, a picture here about the, about our FX okay. situation here. All right. So if you look at our, our trade um, numbers, we've seen a 1.9 drop deficit in our trade. That's an unfavorable balance of payments. Yes, we've seen yeah. a 1.9 drop. However, the trade volume has increased. Our oil exports, our oil exports is, is the largest source of our FX revenue, which is about 90% 90, 90 of... And it's, it's also gone down. It's also gone down, exactly. So that's one angle. So the second angle right now is the demand and supply issue. So this is around the period where we we'll have a lot of people going to schools. If you look at the FX education outflow from the year 2015, from 2015, Nigerians spent about 500 million in FX outflows in education. Right now, in 2021, it's up by 6 billion. That's a large increase. If you go to the bank to try and get an FX, you only get like $15,000 per session. The average rate of tuition is about 30,000. So the, what is left, you have to go to the BDC market and so So the supply on that side has been reduced by the, by the CBN, and then we have also seen a, an increase in demand for FX. So it's a demand and supply issue. The demand is outweighing the supply. Hence, that's where we are on the market. So let's see how the second phase of this implementation of, of, the, law has, of the law is going to be like. Let's see what happens. Because this was the first phase, so there's a lot of panic in the market. And like I said, there's so much demand right now. By the second, by the second phase of the implementation, we might probably see a better view on the effect. So back to the MPC meeting. So we... No, but before you go, are you saying there'll, there'll be a time where demand, I mean, because you did mention school fees and, yeah. you know, this period, and are you saying there'll be a time when the demand would at least slow so that the rate so, will balance so, so let's look at it from the point of, can we say a point where we supply will increase? Nigeria, <laughs> is, a, yes, Nigeria is a highly import-dependent nation. About 60% of every product that we have has an FX element into it. Let's, let's even go as far as looking at LNG, the cooking gas. It's up by 81% because why? We import, I know. <laughs> so we import a lot of it. If you look at a lot of our consumer goods are highly imported. So Nigeria is a highly import-dependent nation. Being a highly import-dependent nation is not a problem. China, which is the largest export um, country in the world, is also the second largest import um, dependent nation too. So the issue right now is can we try and increase our supply to meet the demand? There's always going to be a demand for dollar. 
So mm. we have to try and see ways we can increase the uh, Well, I think we have discussed it a whole lot. It's a conversation we have had many times. Yes, yes, but, yes. but maybe maybe you have the answer. How do you okay. think we can <laughs> we can deal with this problem? Because uh, I'm not the Zibian <laughs> governor. But I know, right? <laughs> okay, so, so, so basically, um, like I said, let me paint another picture to you. So we are at a point where we are at an import substitution policy. One of the ways to try and increase our FX supply is to move towards an export-led industrial policy that is trying to find ways to increase our manufacturing sector or follow into what I call the whole value chain. So for example now, let's look at cocoa beans. We export a large amount of that and still import about 85% of that in chocolate. Mm -hmm. If you look at tomato as well and so, so many other agricultural produces here. So why not find a way to try and increase the export-led industries? And that way would have a definitely an increase in, in dollar supply. Another right, thing you should look at is ease of doing business. As you all know, like we are facing an insecurity crisis basically in a large amount of areas in, in Nigeria. And that's even responsible for why we have a drop in foreign inflows. Uh, we have only about like eight states in Nigeria having for inflows out of 36 states. That's, that's beyond our, that's below our capacity. There's so much more to be done. So if we move from import, import substitution policies to export-led industrial policies mm. to try and see how we can increase or give leverage to exporters, definitely would have an increase well, in supply. Well, I, I guess... Uh, Unfortunately, the conversation is still the, same. still the same. You know, the suggestions are there, the ideas are there. But when it comes to implementation, then yeah. we just seem to fall short. And, uh, well, anyway, let's uh, talk about the factor, the NPC factor in the market. How do you see it affecting the market? So, like I said, we've had a lot of good and positive data that's come out right now. You see our GDP growth rate from 0 0.51 to 5.01. See our for, um, for consumer drop in inflation. So two things might happen in this NPC. Mm. Either they would maintain rates or would see a drop. We've not seen a drop in our NPC chart this year. So we might probably see a drop to 11 from where it was at. And also probably they might also maintain. But it looks like one verge of a more or less a gradual U-shaped recovery. You know, all things being equal, but it's slow and gradually. But, you know, when we say we're on the verge of recovery, uh, a lot of people out there would question it because the reality doesn't seem to say that. For instance, when, we, when the inflation figures came out and uh, we say, oh, there's a tapering of the inflation, and people are asking, where is it? And then we had the, the beautiful 5.01 GDP, and people are asking, oh, where is the growth? You know, so, I mean, how does the MPC, the figures from the MPC, how does it affect the man on the streets? How does it, okay. <laughs> how does it change my life? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 okay, so about the M, so about the inflation figures. So, basically, what ha what's happening right now is the base effect. About this time last year, the rate of increase in goods and services compared to this year is lower. That's one aspect. But if you look at the core inflation, that is the inflation that takes away energy and, and food crisis, that's a, that was a on an increase, we saw it from 13.09 to 13.72%. So there's still a large amount of inflationary pressures there. So how it affects the, the, the layman or, the, or, or me and you is going to be slow. So we have a problem of economic trans um, transmission right now. Mm. The economic activities, but it's not generally transmitting, but all these things will take time. So let's see where the inflation figures comes out and um, it come out by 15 by the 15th or 16th of this month and let's see what the NPC has in store for us there might be probably further forbearance packages or maybe loan packages to help boost the economy to a proper recovery growth and definitely economic transmission at that point in time we'll start to see it or feel it with, with what's happening around us but this is just the first positive quarter we've had since the pandemic so Let's give or take till we enter Q4. We have this is the last month of Q3. Mm -hmm. So with all of these things put into put, put together, we probably foresee a maintenance or a job by zero point by five basis points. Mm. And the federal government is uh, looking at a single digit inflation by 2023. Do you see that being a reality? Nothing is not is impossible. <laughs> Nothing is possible. Reason, reason being, if so, if you look at the percentage drop or the level of seeing the jobs happen and the growth, see where we came from from a negative. If you do a a year on year from a negative six point zero 
the lowest we've had in 10 decades to a negative 6.32 to a positive 0 0.1, positive 0 0.5, now 5.1. So with that level of growth, so the issue right now, can we transmit it to where we can see market prices? So that's with the focus and with that belief, see where we put our benchmark for the oil prices at 40. Oil price right now is at 72. And there's well room or this lead way for it to reach 75. So if all these things are put in place, that's possible. What about the other realities, the issue of uh, uh, security or insecurity, you know? Well, well, the imports, the pendency, and uh, reduction in trade and stuff like that. So, uh, well, uh, one of the things that would probably help is the African Free Trade um, Trade Agreement, which, and then the PIA, which was, oh, it has been PIB for quite a long time, but now it's PIA. So, we also, we all that being implemented, and then the supplementary budgets had a large amount of it being invested into the insecurity, the 900 billion, about 85% of that was invested into procuring debt. So mm. there's a heavy fight on that, on, on insecurity and the ease of doing business as well. I think our index right now is about 52. The, pro, the point right now is how can we increase to 54? So everything is a gradual process. It's a gradual process, and I think the government is looking on how to attack all that. However, the big question or the big issue right now is our debt servicing. <laughs> that's, that's another big <laughs> elephant in the room. So, so if we are going to be doing all this, if we are going to be servicing this amount of debt, let it, let it be poised towards capital expenditures and towards ease of doing business as well. Uh, so, and it seems we are taking even more, you know. Yeah, we're taking even more. Mm -hmm. Our debt servicing to revenue is as 90%. 90, yeah, 90, the, no, 90, I think about 98 yeah, or so, yeah. Higher, above, above that, highest we've had in about 15 years. Yes. Our debt stop has increased from 12 trillion in 2015 to 33 trillion right now where we stand. So with this young, humongous increases in debt, borrowing is not a problem. This right now is, are we borrowing for, for what? Exactly. So are we borrowing for capital expenditures, which in turn will increase our exports? So far, exports? can we say we are efficiently using our borrowings? Can we, can we just say that? Well, from the debt services to revenue ratio and then the debt to GDP, we are not there yet. There's still a lot of room to, to there's still a lot of room for improvement. Look at how the manufacturing sector grew and other sectors in the GDP growth rate um, data release, there's still so much to be done in that aspect. So we are not maximizing our potential on our borrowings, and there's still a lot of room or jobs to be done there. Wow. Oh, <laughs> this is our reality yes. in Nigeria, and we do hope uh, that the, the light we see at the end of no, the tunnel not. will come closer and closer. If we, if we keep on moving. If we keep on moving. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dumebi Odibu. I'm uh, a fixed income dealer with uh, UBA. Thank you so much for joining us Thank this you. evening. We do appreciate your time. Thank you. So uh, just before we close the program, the Nigerian... Exchange Group PLC has held its 60th annual general meeting, which is its first AGM as a demutualized and shareholder-owned profit-making entity. At the end of the meeting, the shareholders approved the group's proposals to introduce equity-based incentives to employees, remuneration, including an employee share ownership plan and a long-term incentive plan. In addition to the re-election of the non-executive directors and the election of the members of the audit committee, the chairman of NGX Group, group Abimbola Ogumbanjo, says he is more confident that the group is well positioned to deliver value to shareholders as it moves into a new growth phase. And in another story, Pan-African financial institution, UBA, has released its result for the first half of 2021, which shows a result of resilient performance within the period. According to the financial statement sent to the Nigerian Stock Exchange, the Tier 1 lender recorded a 5% growth in its group's gross earnings, which rose to 316 billion naira up from 300.6 billion now reported same period last year. Similarly, its profit before tax grew by 33.4% to 76.2 billion naira in June 2021. Profit after tax jumped by 36.3% to 60.6 billion naira, while its total asset soared 7.4% to hit the 8 trillion naira mark as at the 30th of June. Meanwhile, the company's board has declared a 20 copper per share in tariff dividend for its shareholders. 
Similarly, Guarantee Trust Holding Company, GT Co., has released a second quarter audited result for the period ended the 30th of June, showing a lower than expected performance. According to the earnings report sent to the Nigerian Exchange, the company's gross earnings stood at 207.91 billion naira in the second quarter of this year, a decline when compared to 225.14 billion naira recorded in the same period last year. At the same time, the group reported a profit before tax of about 93.1 billion naira, representing a dip of 15.2% compared to 109.7 billion naira in the second quarter of last year. Also, GTCO posted an after tax profit of 79.41 billion naira in the second quarter of 2021 from 94.27 billion naira in the second quarter of last year. Meanwhile, the group has declared an interim dividend of 30 cover per share for which shareholders. Well, that's the much we can take on the program. Thank you so much for joining us on Capital Market. Let's do this again next week. I'm Ini John McFarland.